Thank you, Jan Stauffer, for beginning our service today. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Church. I'm John Fry, pastor of Worship Ministries, and we're so glad that you came to Calvary today. And as we begin the service of worship, I'd like to read some verses from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. trumpet and sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipes. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord.
You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Calvary Church. I know that you're maybe having a hard time connecting the voice with where I'm located. Normally, I'm up on the platform, but I'm over here by the organ. Everybody can find me here this morning. And I'm here for a specific reason, and that's because today we're celebrating and honoring Jan Stauffer. Jan has been playing the organ here at Calvary Church for 23 years, and she has come to the place where she has decided to retire. So we are here to celebrate her and honor her. And just to be clear, just because she's retiring doesn't mean the organ is going away. She's going to teach me how to play and how to... No, <laughs> kidding, kidding. Listen, I don't know if you know how impressive it is what she's, because it's not only the hands, but the feet going as well. The pedals down here making, sometimes I can't even walk and do something with my hands at the same time, and she does. So just, Jan, we're so thankful for um, your years of faithful ministry and service, being able to go from the organ to the keyboard to the piano, and serving God and serving the people of Calvary Church uh, in such a faithful way. We will miss you, but I know that you said you will be back. Uh, to, to continue to be a part of what we're doing here, and we're grateful for that. Um, and so we have uh, uh, some flowers for you. John's going to bring some flowers uh, on behalf of all the people at Calvary Church. We just want to take the time now to thank you for all you've done. Thank you for honoring and thanking Jan. You may be seated. I'm going to put her on the spot because I've got to get from here up to there. So I want to see if she can play me a little traveling music on the organ. Are you up for that? There we go. Ah, that's good. That's good. See, it's for that very reason that the organ shouldn't go away. You can have a lot of fun with it. So Jan, thank you very much. And as we say goodbye to Jan, we say hello to a lot of new faces today uh, here at Calvary Church. Uh, every Sunday is somebody's first Sunday. So if you are a guest with us here today, welcome to Calvary Church. We're glad that you're here. We would love to be able to connect with you personally, and we've created an environment for that to take place. It's at our welcome gathering. As soon as this service ends, in the east end of the lobby, to my right, your left, there's a room down there, the sign that says welcome gathering will take no more than 10 minutes of your time, and it's an opportunity for us to connect with you, for you to ask any questions that you might have uh, about Calvary Church. Uh, so we'd love to be able to connect with you, invite you to come. Um, and one of the things that you can do for us is in the pew rack in front of you, there's a connection card. You can take that card out. You can fill that out. You can bring that with you to the welcome gathering today. Uh, we'd love to be able to connect and orient you to Calvary Church. Um, now, we are transitioning into the fall, and we are, we've made a little bit of a change with our King's Kids. Um, I want to see a show of hands, kids in the room, kindergarten to grade six. Can, can I see a show of hands? There's a few. See, if I would have said, raise your hand and I'll give you a piece of candy, I would have had hands go flying up like that. Okay, just want to make sure you guys are all out there. You know that we've got King's Kids now on Sunday morning, and when you see in the bulletin when you're supposed to leave, there'll be a little asterisk, and if there's an asterisk by a song, then you leave at the beginning of that song when that song starts. So uh, we're excited about what you guys are learning there in King's Kids and look forward to hearing you lead us a little bit later in the fall. Now, for all of us... Tonight is a very important night here at Calvary Church. At five o'clock, we have an open house out in the lobby. The lobby is pretty much done. We're still waiting for some more furniture, but it's pretty much complete. And tonight's a chance for us to thank all the contractors, to thank all of those that are involved. But it's also a chance for you to come and hear what we had in mind, to hear how the different areas that you see out there, we, how we envision them being used. So we encourage you to come at five o'clock for that time, and then to stay at six o'clock for our annual church meeting. Now, I know it doesn't sound very 
very interesting or exciting to come to a church meeting, but I want to challenge the members and the regular attenders of Calvary Church to come tonight, to be a part of what's going to happen tonight. There's always some special things that take place, and there's two that are of significance that you need to know about. One is the vote that's going to be taking place on the, the elders' recommendation uh, for, on the Constitution and doctrinal statement. We've been talking about that for six months, so that's nothing new. So we're going to have that vote tonight. But we're also going to spend some time talking about the finances of Calvary Church church. Many of you have asked us questions about finances, indebtedness, global ministry. What about all the different funds and how does that work in the envelopes and can I designate? And we've taken some of those questions. We're going to have a discussion about that, but there might be a question that you have that maybe you're afraid won't get answered. Right out in the center of the lobby, there's a table that you can go to this morning. Take a note card, write your question about finances, drop it in there, and we will hope to get to that tonight at the annual meeting. Now, I know it's not always the most convenient thing, but I've arranged the schedule today. The Eagles play at 1. The Steelers play at 8.30. So the Eagles game will be over. We'll start here at 5 o'clock. You'll be done in plenty of time to get home to watch the Steelers. I know it's a school night. I know life is full and busy, but maybe at least one representative from your household could come and be a part of what we're doing tonight here at Calvary Church. It's an important time in the life of the church. Now, at this time, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. We're going to receive our morning offering. Thank you so much for all of you that faithfully give to support the vision of Calvary Church. And as we do that, Jan and the brass section will be leading us this morning in our offertory.
The song that they just played was the great hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And as we transition now into a time of prayer, I'm going to focus in on the powerful name of Jesus. So as we do that, would you rise to your feet with me and let's pray together. Father God in heaven, this morning we pause to think and ponder the power of Jesus' name. It's because of the power of his name that the heavens and the earth were created. It's because of the power of his name that we have life and breath and meaning. It's because of the power of his name that we can pray this morning for those that are being persecuted all around the globe. It's because of the power of his name that we can pray for healing and comfort and peace for those among us that are sick or in the hospital or hospice care and for the families of those that have recently lost loved ones. It's because the power of Jesus' name that we can pray for those that are lost, for those that need to hear the life-changing message of the gospel For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And it's because of the power of Jesus' name that this morning we're able to ascribe to you wisdom and honor and to tell you that your glory is great in all the earth. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The world is yours, and everything in it is all at your command. There is no end to your domain. The planets shake, the galaxies tremble, they turn within your hands. There is no end to your domain. Eternity. You are Lord 
Lord and the King. You may be seated. Culture. It's what happens when we do life together. Diversity. Isn't it amazing? People are so different, yet so much alike. Gospel. Life-giving truth that speaks into every moment, everywhere, yet never changes. You and me. How can we make that timeless gospel known to people like us and unlike us in the midst of our ever-changing culture? I like that tune. I think it's catchy. Gospel and culture is what we have been talking about these last few weeks. And you've seen that video, that roll-in video now a few times, and I'm curious if you're catching the words that are scripted and being read there. One of the last statements says this. How do we make that timeless gospel known. That's what this series is about. This series is about how do we make the timeless message of the gospel known. We've been talking for these last two weeks and setting up really for what's coming and going to happen today and next week, and it's getting into the specifics of when I need to share the truth of the gospel with someone that is lost, if you're sitting in a spot in the auditorium that you can't see this sign, this sign says lost, this sign over here to my left, your right says life. How do you help somebody that is lost find life in Christ? How do we help somebody that doesn't know God to find life in God? And some have said, this word lost, well, it's an offensive word in our culture. People don't like to be lost. Men don't like to be lost. But I don't think it's as offensive as we think that it is. You see, most people are searching. Look at all the different religions of the world. Look at all the different diversity that's there. People are searching for answers. And you might be sitting in this room or you might be listening to my voice over the radio or the internet this morning and part of the reason that you're here or part of the reason that you're tuning in is because you resonate with that idea of you're lost and you're looking for answers and you're not offended by that. You say, I'll readily admit that I'm lost. Can somebody please point me in the right direction? And so whether that's you this morning or whether you know people that are lost spiritually, we're going to talk very specifically about how you can be a part of helping somebody that's lost to find life in Christ. So this morning we're going to jump right in to our passage. So turn with me to Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, and as they're doing that, if you guys up there in the booth can help me to see here, that would be great. Um, page 926, if you're joining the conversation on Twitter, gospel and culture, thank you, gospel and culture is the hashtag. Let's jump in. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16, says this. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of of idols. You see, Paul experienced firsthand the lostness of other people. He experienced what they were going through. And he understood and he saw the idols and he saw and experienced their lostness and he said, my spirit is provoked. I've got to hear and to respond and give them the message of salvation, the message of the gospel that they need. And here's how he goes and does it, verse 17. 
So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be preaching of foreign divinities. Now, why did they say, what does this babbler have to say? And, and why did they think that he was preaching foreign divinities? Because right there in the middle of verse 18 gives us the context for his whole speech and his whole message. It says this. It says, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Why was Paul preaching Jesus and the resurrection. He was preaching Jesus and the resurrection because this is how lost people find life in Christ. The message of Jesus and the resurrection is how lost people get saved. The message of Jesus and the resurrection saves lost people. That's why he's preaching it. So when you have the opportunity to share your faith, that conversation might take lots of twists and turns, but at some point, you have to come to the place where you're talking about Jesus and the resurrection because that's the good news of the gospel. And that's the message of how lost people get saved. One of the things I like to do when I have the opportunity to talk to someone is to simply ask them this question to say, if there was another way, if it was just a plethora of religions and they all lead to the same God and it doesn't matter how you get there, but we're all on a journey. If that was true, if there was some other way for the problem of your lostness to be taken care of, then why would God send Jesus to die on the cross and to be resurrected from the dead. And that leads to a great conversation because it challenged them to think about their worldview and it challenged them to think about how do you find life in God and life in Christ. You see, and what I like to say is, you see, if it was just a list of good works, if it was just a prayer that you could pray, if it was just putting a certain amount of money in the offering plate, if that was the way that you could find life in Christ, then why send Jesus to die on the cross? To me, that the fact that God went through that of extreme of a solution, to me, says that's the only solution. And the challenge then becomes... You can't say, yeah, I believe that Jesus died on the cross, but I need to add to it. I need to, to add my good works to it or, or, or to add this to it or to add that to it. Yeah, that's fine that Jesus died and rose again, but I still have to do this, that, and the other thing. In a sense to me, that's an insult to God to say that I can add on to what he has done as if it was incomplete this is the reason why Paul was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. Because this is the message of the gospel and this is how lost people find life in Christ. To recognize that they can't do anything to solve their own problem, but they need to just put their faith and trust in him because God has provided a way. So Paul goes on in verse 19, and they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus and saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears and we wish to know therefore what these things mean. Verse 21, I love this. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling and hearing something new. It was quite the life that they were living. Sitting around, talking, philosophy, religion, whatever it might be, spending their time talking about something new. So Paul, in the midst of that context, says, I need to redirect your thinking to what's right and what is true. And I think the way that he does it will be very, very helpful to you and me. 
as we think about how we would engage with someone that needs to hear this message. And it's all centered around the concept and the phrase of him being sensitive. And I think it's important because the message of the truth is important, but the way that we approach people is also important. So there's four ways that Paul is sensitive as he goes through this speech and this declaration of truth. First, be sensitive, finding common ground. Be sensitive, finding common ground with others. Look what it says in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Why does he say that? Because he's walked around the town and he's seen the idols and he's seen the temples. Notice what he didn't do. His spirit was provoked about the idol worship. Notice that he didn't go and start smashing and destroying idols. He didn't knock them down and break them and destroy them and say, and this idolatry's got to go. You need to worship the one true God. That wasn't his approach. But sometimes with other people, that's our approach. Do you remember the disciples when Jesus went into uh, the towns in Samaria and they wouldn't receive Jesus? The disciples said, should we call down fire from heaven to destroy them? What is it that's in us that we want to judge and destroy and condemn people that think differently than we do? That's what the disciples wanted to do. But Paul says, I'm not going to start with the message of let's destroy the idols, but I'm going to start with a message of do we have any common ground? And he says, yes, I'm a religious person. I can perceive that you are a very religious person as well. Now, you know what I find interesting about this? That Paul walked around their city and from what he saw, he perceived that they were a people that were very religious. Imagine if Paul was, got into a time machine and came to 21st century Lancaster County and spent a couple days touring Lancaster County. Maybe he'd get on the coach bus and go and visit Amish country and see a lot of churches, Mennonite churches, and maybe he'd go to Sight and Sound and see a show there. After spending a couple days in Lancaster County, what do you think Paul would say about us? I think he would say the exact same thing that he said to them. Men and women of Lancaster County, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Wouldn't he say that? Isn't the culture and at least the appearance of where we live a very religious place? But would he find people that are experiencing life in Christ or would he just find an empty shell of religion? It'd be interesting to see. So I think the challenge that he has for them is the same that he might have for us. And I think it's easier than you think it is to find common ground, particularly with people in Lancaster County. Be sensitive in finding common ground and begin and start there. But it doesn't end there. It's not just about finding common ground. Because when you find common ground, you know the next thing that you're going to experience and the next thing that might come out in your conversation with others is that you might discover that they have some uncertainty about what they believe. Be sensitive addressing their uncertainty. You see, the people in Athens were very religious, but they weren't very certain. And Paul knows that by what he observed. Look what verse 23 says. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. He says, you've got all these idols, all these temples, 
And in their worldview, they had a God for everything. They had a God that made the grass green and they had a God that, you know, brought them food and they had a God that made the sunshine and a God that did this and a God that did that. But just to make sure they had all of their bases covered, they said there could be that there's a God out there that we're not sure of. Or maybe in five years, somebody's going to introduce a new God that we're not sure of. And we want to make sure that we don't offend that God. So let's just put an idol to him. And, and we don't know his name yet, but we're going to put it, you know, this is to the unknown God. And when that God shows up, we can say, see, we knew about you. We weren't sure what your name was, but, but just in case we miss something, here's your idol and here's where we worship you. This was their just-in-case God. Just in case we were wrong or just in case we missed something. You say, oh, that was just first century Athens. People aren't like that today, are they? Do people have a just-in-case mentality today? Let me push on you a little bit. There are some people that feel like they have their life together, but they're still come to church on Christmas and Easter. You know why? Just in case. Well, I don't, I don't really need church for me. I've kind of got things figured out, but I'm going to bring my kids. It'd be great if my kids had some church just in case. I'm going to put some money in the offering plate when it goes by. I'm not really concerned about supporting the church and what they're doing, but if God sees me put that 20 in the, in, in the basket, maybe just in case. I think people live that way a lot today. It wasn't just then. You might not have an idol on your mantle that says to the unknown God, but there's a lot of things that people can do today just in case. So I think as you talk to folks, as you engage with people about their worldview, as you talk to them about spirituality, they're going to have a lot of uncertainty. And when they do, should you blast them for their uncertainty? No, be sensitive as you talk to them about their uncertainty. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, how could a good God allow bad things in this world? That's somebody that maybe believes in God, but they have questions. They're uncertain. Yeah, I think I might believe in God, but the Bible, eh, isn't there contradictions in the Bible? You ever heard that one? Hey, let's talk about those contradictions. Can you show me one? I'd love to be able to talk with you about that. Well, the Gospels, and there's different, you know, uh, you know the Gospels about Jesus' life, and the, have you read the Gospels? Do you know why the Gospels are there? You know that they're really biographies of the life of Jesus? That's what they are. Do you like to read biographies? Maybe you've read about Lincoln or Washington. You want to read a biography about the life of Jesus? That's what the Gospels are. Written by four different people from four different perspectives with four different audiences and minds and purpose in mind. It would only make sense that there's some things in there that have a little bit of a different emphasis. Why don't you start and... Read the Gospel of Mark. And then let's keep talking about this. Don't take their uncertainty and blast them for it. Be sensitive with their uncertainty and help to push them along. Find common ground. Be sensitive with their uncertainty. And now Paul begins to explain truth. And again, I think he does it in a sensitive way. He doesn't blast them. He doesn't declare. He doesn't preach. He explains to them. He explains to them how their worldview is off. And he helps to bring truth into the situation. But here's what he doesn't do. He doesn't come to them with a preconceived presentation of the gospel. You see, he's been discerning. He's been listening to them. He's been hearing what they believe in seeing and observing it. And his presentation of the gospel is based off of where they were. I'm not saying at all that there's anything wrong with having a pre-planned presentation of the gospel. The one-verse method, Romans Road, four spiritual laws. 
whatever it might be. All of those things can be very helpful and handy. But it's not helpful and handy if you approach every situation the same way and just drop on your pre, pre, pre-planned presentation. Too many P's in there. Presentation of the gospel. It's great to have that on your tool belt, but listen and be discerning. That's what Paul is doing here as he explains truth to them. Verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. He starts where they are. He starts with what he observes in their life. You see these temples? I I bet he pointed to them when he said this. You see these temples? God doesn't live in these temples. God is much bigger than that. You've put God in a box. He's too big for your temples. Verse 25. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. You see, their view of the gods was, what can we give to the gods to keep them happy? Here's food. Here's money. Here's a sacrifice. Please allow the sun to continue to shine. Please keep my kids healthy. What can I give to appease the gods? He says, no, that's not who God is. He's not served by human hands. But he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Change the way that you're thinking about who God is. Verse 26, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. You see, they thought there's territorial gods, whether there's the God over this region and the God over that region. No, God made everyone. And, and the diversity that's there in the nations, that was by design. God wants that diversity. So there's that, that all the different people worshiping him, it brings him more honor and glory. God is not impersonable. You don't live life by chance or luck or karma. But he's the personal creator God that is involved and sustains the world. He's shifting. He's explaining truth. He's helping them to see and change their world view. Verse 27. He says, God did all this so that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. I think what Paul is saying there is he has created us in a way and even though sin is there, we're still created in the image of God and we have a desire within us for God in our life. I think he's pointing them back and saying, look, you're very religious. You're trying to work your way back to God. Even you have this desire within you to seek after him. And some people don't even realize that's what it is, but that is imprinted in us because we're created in the image of God. I think St. Augustine or Augustine got it correct when he said this. You made us for yourself, and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. I think that's true. I think that's what Paul is saying here. We have something within us that longs for and desires relationship with our Creator. And because of sin... We come up with all these different religious systems to try to work our way back to God and that's what Paul is explaining to them. He's explaining why and how they're off. He says he is actually not far from each of us. He's not far from us. He does want that relationship with us. He wants lost people to find life in Christ. It's interesting what he says then in verse 28. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. When you first read that, you might say, there we go. You might say, what scripture is he quoting there? 
And as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. He's not quoting scripture. He's quoting their philosophers and their poets. Now stop and think about that just for a minute. Because for some of us, it might be a little bit of a challenge in how we normally think about the Bible and Scripture. Our Scriptures, the Bible, God's Word, has quotations in it from secular philosophers and secular poets. Do you realize that that's true? Do you realize what Paul is doing is he's continuing to find common ground with them. He's saying even the people that you believe in and look to and trust in They're saying things, they're identifying things that are true. They don't have all the right answers, but let me use that as a launching point for you. So do you know that it's okay to do that in your conversation with people? Hey, did you see that TV show or did you hear that song? You know, and in that song he's saying this, and and let's talk about that concept. You see, it's why we did what we did during the First Peter Under Pressure series. Just in case you forgot, guys, can we cue that up just for a moment here this morning? You remember that? 1981, Queen, David Bowie, a song from the culture, from the world that we live in. And in that song, they identify the fact that we live lives that are under pressure. And you can point into the culture and say, look, even they identify that we live a life that's under pressure. Did they provide the solution to that in the lyrics of the song? I don't think so. At the end, they talk about love and whatever, but it's kind of ambiguous. But you can use that with people as a stepping stone to say, do you feel that way? Queen and David Bowie, they identified that problem. Here's the solution. That's why the the title of the series was Handling Pressure God's Way from 1 Peter. Not Handling Pressure Queen's Way. They just identified the issue. Scripture provides the solution. That's what Paul's doing. Quoting their philosophers, quoting their poets to bring them and lead them to truth. He's using common ground in the culture to help to explain truth to them. Now, I know that opens the door for a whole other conversation about how much should we be in the world and should we isolate and, you know, be protected from those. I understand that. That's a message and a a discussion for another day. And there's times that we should be isolated from what goes on in the culture, but I promise you this. If we live a a total life that is isolated from what's going on around us, we'll never have any influence in the culture that we live in. So you've got to navigate and find that tension and that balance. So he uses this quote by their poets and says this in verse 29. Notice how he launches from the truth that he sees from their poets into bringing them truth about God. Verse 29, your very poet said that we're indeed his offspring. So he says, therefore, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. If we are his offspring, God is not a God of gold and silver and stone that we, no, no. He's actually more like us relational, desiring a relationship with us. So he's explaining truth, correcting their thinking. Common ground. Be sensitive with uncertainty. Explain truth. And finally, he asks for a change. He asks for a change in the way that they think and in what they believe. Don't stop short of this. Be sensitive, asking for change. Watch what he says. Watch what he does. Verse 30. He says, The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere. 
to repent. Let's break down this verse. He says, the times of ignorance God overlooked. That sounds like a strong word, doesn't it, ignorance? But what he's saying there is people have a longing and a desire for God. But the way that they've thought about God and the way that they've thought about getting to God and finding life in him has been wrong. So those times of ignorance, those times of wrong thinking about rightly relating to God, God has overlooked those times. God doesn't come and zap us or immediately judge us when we think ignorantly about him, about him and the way that we should be rightly related to him. But God has actually overlooked that because God's patient and God's loving and God's kind and God wants everybody to come and find repentance. So he says, but now, but now in first century Athens, now is the time. 21st century Lancaster County, now is the time for all people everywhere not just people in Lancaster County, not just people in the United States, all people everywhere to repent. Oh, repent, finally. Hellfire and brimstone. Finally, we get to yell at people. Stop doing those evil things. Is that what it means there? No, repent actually fits very nicely with that word ignorance because you know what the word repent means? It means to change your mind to change your thinking, to stop and turn and go in the other direction. It's time to change your thinking about the way that you thought that you should be rightly related to God. It's time for people that are lost, that are striving and straining and doing good works and, and, and bowing and praying and giving money and all these things that they're trying to do to work their way back to God. It's time for them to think differently about how you get back to God. About how you find life in Christ. And remember, the context of this is he's talking about Jesus and the resurrection. Stop messing with your idols. Stop messing with that worldview. Jesus has died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the dead to give you life. And it's faith and trust in him that brings life. Think differently. Repent, turn and go the other direction. It lines up nicely with what Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. What promise? The promise of judgment, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you and you and you and all of us and all of them. Why is he patient? Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. Let me share something with you this morning that might be a revelation for some of you. God cares about lost people more than you do. God cares about lost people more than you do. He wants to see lost people repent and find salvation in Jesus not wishing that any should perish, but that all, everyone, not just Republicans, not just white people from Lancaster County, but all people should reach repentance. That's God's heart. That's God's desire. Back to Acts 17. But there is a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness and that's going to happen through Jesus Christ by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. He has been patient. He has overlooked. But the time is coming when the clock will run out. When the clock will run out on people that are lost. That's why the message of the gospel needs to get out into people's lives and their world. Because one day it's going to be too late. One day it's going to be too late. One day it might be too late for you. That's why in verse 30, he says, but now, but now, 
today. Today's the day. Today's the day to repent and to change your thinking. So as you're thinking about that this morning, I want to share a story with you. It's the story of Molly. Molly epitomizes what we've just worked through today because Molly would rightly admit that in her ignorance, she was striving and straining towards God in different ways. But you know what happened with Molly? She kept searching and she kept seeking and she kept asking questions and people were sensitive with her in answering her questions. And there was a day recently, within the last couple months, that was Molly's day. It was her day to find life in Christ. It was the day, it was her but now day, where she came and she found repentance. And she gave her life to Jesus Christ. I want you to hear her story. Let's look to the screens. So, Molly, I've known you for about six months and uh, have been walking with you on your journey towards life in Christ. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to our congregation and tell them a little bit of your, your story. Sure. Um, my name is Molly Brennan. I grew up in the Lutheran Church all of my life. I um, was baptized Lutheran, spent every year of my life and every Sunday going to church and just you know, doing what I knew best while I was there. Um, when I went to college, I started attending a Catholic Mass. Um, it was just available to me on campus, and so I thought rather than not go to church at all, that was a better option. So then during my junior year of college, my best friend approached me and proposed the idea of me becoming Catholic. Um, I guess she saw in me that it was becoming a part of my life and thought that that would be a good option. So she helped me through that process for a whole year, and I um, converted to Catholicism. And when I came home from school, I stopped attending church altogether and really lost that aspect in my life that was so important to me for as long as I knew it. Um, so back in March of this past year, I was approached by my fiance to come attend Calvary Church and to maybe just give it a try and see if it was something that I would like and would be interested in doing. So you started attending Calvary and something was different about Calvary than previous church experience. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. What was different? Um, the, I guess the main thing that I found that I really liked was that I was able to walk away from a church service and really understand what was preached to me and um, what was spoken. I typically, you know, you hear a Bible passage at church and you might not be able to get anything out of it and I was able to apply what I heard and really make it my own and just I felt like it was a very unified church service but it wasn't a very repetitive I think the main thing that I, I realized was I've always heard the Bible in church um, but it was always just read through and never explained and for the first time in 23 years of my life I actually understood a Bible passage to its capacity and was able to see how I could apply it to myself hmm. so after experiencing that that was a big thing that I wanted to get from you was, you know, is this is this what it's like every time? Because this is what I loved and I want more of what I'm seeing. We had one conversation in my office and you, you realized you thought you were a Christian before that conversation, right. but walking away, you, you were pretty sure you had a, a bad definition of uh -huh. what it meant to be a Christian. So talk to me about the week that followed and the meeting that we had later mm -hmm. that next week. Right. You know, I decided that I wanted to live a life in Christ and the words that stick out in my mind from that night was just crossing over from death into life and really putting my trust in Him. Growing up, you you hear the story, Christ died, He was resurrected, rose again, you know, for your sins, but what does it mean? And I think I was able to really see that concept with other passages you shared with me that you know he gave his life for your sins and no matter what he you know he forgives you and died so that you could have a better life and that he is the one that ultimately did save you because i mean that's that's what it's all about to hear from her own lips and her own mouth to say i went from death to life because of trusting in Jesus. And that just happened a couple months ago, and this morning in the first service, after we heard her testimony, 
Ben and Molly came into that baptistry and she was baptized. And we... <clears throat> we videotaped it so that you guys could see it as well. So let's watch Molly's baptism. Molly, it's been an honor to walk with you as you've taken steps towards life in Christ. And uh, it's my privilege as your brother in Christ to baptize you this morning. And so the only question that I have for you is, is Jesus the Lord of your life? Yes, he is. Well, then based on your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to live a new life. decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning Molly decided to follow Jesus, and many of you have decided to follow Jesus as well. And when we hear her testimony and see her baptism, it reminds us of the joy of our salvation. But I need to challenge us this morning. You see, there are lost people that each of us knows. And my challenge is, that as you think about neighbors and family members and loved ones and coworkers that you know are lost, can you find ways and pray about ways for you to sensitively share the gospel with them? Because they're lost and they need the life-giving message of the gospel. And it's wonderful that you're praying for them and I know that there are some of you that have been praying for a loved one or for a neighbor or for a coworker for years. But Romans chapter 1 says, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. They need to hear the gospel. And if it doesn't come from you, would you at least pray that God would open up a door so that they would hear it from someone else? And that's a challenge for many of us in the room. But as we look at this verse this morning, I think that there are some of us in this room this morning or listening to my voice this morning that, were just, that was just like Molly was. You see, it was this church experience and that church experience and there was an ignorance about the way that she was trying to approach God and then she heard the truth and she repented. And there was a time a few months ago that she had that but now moment. And there are some of you that are here today and you know in your heart that you're lost. You know that you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know that you've never come to the place that you've put your faith and trust in him and him alone. 
and you know you're lost and you're trying to work your way back to God and you're going through the motions and you're doing this and you're doing that and it's tired and it's exhausting. And after hearing this message and hearing the truth about Jesus and the resurrection, you say, that's me. And I'm thankful that God has overlooked, that God is patient, but your but now moment might be today. And my challenge for you is twofold. One, would you be like Molly and continue to seek and ask questions? You've got your doubts, you've got your concerns, but keep seeking. Keep finding people that will be sensitive to you and answer your questions and lead you. Would you allow us at Calvary Church to do that? Come to the Welcome Gathering. Come to the Connection Center. Be in touch with us during the week. We'll be happy to engage with you and have that conversation. But second, right now this morning might be the time that as Molly said, you're going to go from death to life. And you need the opportunity to respond. You see, it's not by your good works. If it was by your good works, no reason to send Jesus. But your sin separates you from God. And your good works or giving amount of money or coming to church cannot bridge that gap. But God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price for your sins. And it's only by putting your faith and your trust in him that you find life in Christ. Would today be the day that you make that decision? And I want to give you the opportunity to do that. Maybe you would take the card out of the pew rack in front of you and you put your name on the front side, and then you'd flip it over on the back. It says, today I'm beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. That as you put your faith and your trust in Jesus in this moment, that you would just check that box and let us know so that we can follow up with you. After the first service, gentleman did that, brought it to the welcome gathering, handed me his card, his name was on the front, I flipped it over, it said, today I'm beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ. That might be you, and that might be the way that you want to respond today. But you might need to connect, and you might need to pray with somebody right now. And in just a moment, I'm going to pray, I'm going to invite the band to come, and we're going to sing a song about salvation in Jesus. And as we sing that song... If today's the day, if today is your but now moment where you're repenting and you're putting your faith and trust in him, just slip out of your seat. Nobody's going to look. Nobody's going to see what you're doing. Point, and just make your way down front. I'm going to be here. If we need, there'll be others that will come to just connect with you, pray with you, so we can help you to know what your next step is. The times of ignorance God has overlooked. But now... Right now, today, he commands all people everywhere to repent. Let's pray. Father, you have provided a way for salvation. Without you, we are lost. And as we hear this message this morning, may those that are lost respond just by simply coming to you, praying quietly in their hearts and saying, God, I know that my sin separates me from you, but I'm putting my faith and trust in you. I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, trusting in him and him alone. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for giving me life in Christ. And Father, in this moment, as we sing, as people respond, May the powerful message of your gospel, the powerful message that you died and rose again, do its work in our lives in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.
Amen. <clears throat> Amen. What a glorious, glorious truth. If you made that decision today for the very first time, that you were lost and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you just simply take that card, put your name on it, check that box on the back. We don't want to, we're not keeping stats. We don't want to point you out. We want to help you to take your next step in Christ. That's all we want to do. Bring that card to the Connection Center or Welcome Gathering. Love to talk with you further. Welcome Gathering is going to start just as soon as we end here. I'd love to be able to connect with any that are first-time guests or anybody that have questions about Calvary Church. Uh, and a reminder about the open house tonight at 5 and the annual meeting at 6. Let's go with these words. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now, but now, he commands all people everywhere to repent. What a glorious message. What a glorious truth. Let's live in light of that truth as we continue to pursue life in Christ together. God bless you all. Have a great day.